Okay. <laughs> are we on? Not yet. It says that we are live streaming on um, Facebook right now. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our virtual training on human trafficking awareness. My name is Sherry Young, and I am the Victim Services Program Director for Lake Family Resource Center. I oversee the Domestic Violence Program, our Housing Stability Program, our Rape Crisis Center, and our newly added Human Trafficking Program. All of our programs focus on family and community violence, prevention, intervention, and treatment services. I've been with the agency for about 10 years, and I am looking forward to offering our very first live stream training on Facebook. And my colleague, Kara, I'll let her go ahead and introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Human Trafficking Awareness Month as well for the month of January. My name is Kara Roberts, and I'm the program coordinator for the uh, human trafficking program. So I've been with the agency for about five years now, We're coming up to five years, and I'm just excited on this new adventure. So just some live stream information, we will not be able to see comments or answer comments as we are providing this live stream presentation. So if you have anything you would like to say or any questions, please still feel free to go ahead and comment. If you're watching this live, hello and welcome. If you are watching a replay, um, again, please feel free to comment and we will be checking back later this afternoon to answer or address any questions or concerns or um, provide any additional information that you might be asking about. So as Kara did say, it is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, January. So we, us, the staff at Lake Family Resource Center have decided to provide a live stream training on human trafficking um, our program, what trafficking looks like, and we'll be providing some events throughout the month. So check back to Lake Family Resource Center's website and enjoy what we will be presenting throughout the month. So human trafficking, um, the contact information for myself and Kara is at the bottom of this slide on the screen. You'll have our email address, our phone numbers, and again, we will provide this at the end of the presentation. Okay. <clears throat> so the point and the objectives of this training is we would like to provide you all with the definition and the types of human trafficking, provide elements of the crime, some local and worldwide statistics and information about human trafficking. We're gonna talk about the traffickers and the recruitment process and some signs of somebody who might be trafficked, and then of course provide resources. So what is human trafficking? Basically, the small definition is that human trafficking is the act of tricking, luring, or forcing a person to work for little or no pay, and it's against their will. People are bought, sold, and traded every day worldwide. Our United United Nations defines human trafficking as the recruitment, transportation, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by improper means, such as force, abduction, fraud, or coercion, tricking, for an improper purpose, including forced labor or sexual exploitation. So let's go ahead and break that down a little bit. There are three elements of the crime that need to happen for this to be, for something to be human trafficking. 
The three elements are actions, means, and purpose. This is called the AMP model. So to break this down, let's look at the action. So here in the first box, you can see some different things that need to happen. So to induce. To induce is to persuade or influence someone into doing something. The recruit, recruiting is to allure somebody. Harboring is to give a person to, or is keeping someone somewhere. Um, transporting is to move somebody from one place to the other. Providing is to give a person to another for some service or for some type of work. Um, did I miss one? Obtaining is to buy a service or a person from a third party. So one of these things has to happen as an action. It could be all of them. It could be one of them. It could be a few of them. The next element is going to be for the means. So force, we could have force, which is through power or through violence. Fraud, which is a false representation of a matter of a fact, um, misleading allegations, et cetera. And coercion, which are going to be threats of harm or violence or any type of plan to cause a person to believe that they are in some type of danger. And then the purpose. The purpose is going to be the result which we are going to see commercial sex, with, which is sex trafficking, or labor services, what we call labor trafficking. Now, there's one exception to this, and this is minors. So anybody who is 18 or under, and if they are induced into commercial sex or human trafficking, regardless if there is force, fraud, or coercion, it is going to be human trafficking. So the means does not need to be present for anyone who is 18 or younger to fall victim of human trafficking. So we're going to show a five minute video and it's going to give different examples of what the AMP model might look like in the situation of sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and child exploitation. Over 20.9 million men, women, and children are victims of human trafficking. But do you know what human trafficking actually is? In a small sleepy town, people are dreaming. But not everyone's dreams will come true. Human traffickers prey on people's dreams and lure them away for their own benefit. How do they do this? Human trafficking doesn't happen all of a sudden. It's a process. First, traffickers act. This includes recruiting victims, transporting them to the place where they'll be exploited, hiding them from authorities, and receiving victims from other traffickers. So why don't the victims run away or say no? Because traffickers use different means. This includes threatening or forcing victims to do what they want, abducting or deceiving the victims and abusing power. Sometimes traffickers promise small payments or benefits to get the victim to cooperate. And why are the traffickers doing this? The purpose of trafficking is exploitation. Traffickers take advantage of victims for their own profit or benefit. This is human trafficking. This man's neighbor tells him that he has a great job for him on a very safe construction site and that he'll be paid a lot of money. With more money, he can make his dreams come true. He agrees to take the job. A few days later, the neighbor's friend picks him up and they drive to the construction site. It's a very long way from his home. This man is put to work immediately without any training or protective equipment, without enough to eat or drink and with very few breaks. After many months, he's only been paid a fraction of what he was promised. He knows he's been tricked, but he doesn't have enough money to get home. This man is a victim of human trafficking. He was recruited by his neighbor and tricked into thinking he was going to work at a safe construction site for fair pay. He 
Instead, he was forced to work long hours in unsafe conditions for almost no money, while others benefited from his exploitation. One day, while looking for jobs online, this woman comes across an opportunity to work in a restaurant in a big city. Her application is successful, and her new employer arranges for her travel there. She is met at the airport and driven to a part of the city that looks nothing like she expected. The car pulls up to a building. The door is shut and locked behind her. She is made to perform sex acts against her will. She is trapped. This woman is a victim of human trafficking. She was transported by a trafficker from the airport to the location of the job. When she arrived at the location and realized it was not the restaurant job she was expecting, the traffickers used force to keep her there. She was then exploited for forced sex work. This 14-year-old boy on school break is approached on the street by a woman who looks trustworthy. She tells him that she needs workers at her factory, and she promises him lots of money. He brings her to meet his parents. They are so happy for him. He'll now be able to save money for school. The woman drives him to the next town. They pull up to an old building. There is someone waiting for him. As he is led inside, the nice lady drives off. The factory isn't anything like she described. There are lots of people working, including many children. He works all day, and after just a few hours of sleep, he starts again. He is sad. This isn't what he expected. He misses his family. After weeks, he still hasn't received any salary or been allowed to contact them. He is trapped. This boy is a victim of human trafficking. He was tricked by the woman who recruited him on the street. He was then received by a trafficker when he arrived at the factory and exploited by being forced to sew clothing. For anyone under the age of 18, only the act and purpose matter for it to legally be a case of human trafficking. Understanding that human trafficking doesn't happen all at once, but instead is a process of act, means, and purpose, helps us better identify victims and trafficking trends. People everywhere are dreaming and looking for opportunities to make those dreams come true. Human trafficking is happening all around us. Will you recognize it when you see it? To learn more, visit iomx.org. So at the very beginning of this webinar, I had said that human trafficking is when somebody is forced to work for little or no pay. But what are the types of human trafficking? So the types that we see are going to be forced labor, so labor trafficking requiring somebody to work in the industry, um, sex trafficking, so being forced to provide sex acts, child sexual exploitation, so children under the age of 18 being required to perform sexual acts, and then trafficking of organ removal. And now the organ removal trafficking does happen, but it's a very low percentage. It's not something we have seen here in Lake County yet, um, but it is one of the recognized types. Thousands of people, again, every day fall victim to human trafficking in worldwide in the United States right here in California, right here in Lake County. Thank you, Cherry. <clears throat> so some of the statistics that we're gonna go over first, we'll go over two sets. This one is for worldwide. Um, 27 million adults and 13 million children are being trafficked currently. It is the second largest criminal industry worldwide to the drug cartel, which it's, it's quickly approaching number one. Um, 30 billion a year is being profited in the US from human trafficking, 150 billion worldwide. 
So these are these are some really big, some prominent numbers here. Eighty percent of the victims that are trafficked um, are sex trafficked. Uh, Nineteen percent would be labor, and then you have the one percent for the organ trafficking. Um, Seventy-one percent of these survivors um, are women and girls. Twenty-nine percent are men and boys. And the average age of entry is going to be between 12 and 14 years old. So the reason for that is um, it's easier to brainwash and take advantage of someone that young. You can work them longer when they're younger. And then there's um, a certain percent of the population that has a fetish for younger children. And I would also like to back up to the second bullet on here where we say that the um, human trafficking is the second largest criminal industry and it is expected to surpass the drug cartel. And the reason why is because if you think about it, drugs and weapons can be sold once, right? But a person can be sold over and over and over again. And the money just keeps rolling in. And so unfortunately, that is why um, it's expected to surpass the drug cartel. So one of the other things that I like to mention in the very beginning is the, the intersection of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. So they are all interwoven in complex ways. And the intersection, it can occur in, in numerous ways. So let me go ahead and give you an example for that. If you have a trafficker who is also a domestic violence abuser, that trafficker can utilize any history of their victim's past. So if they have a victim who happened to be in a domestic violence situation, or perhaps they have witnessed a domestic violence situation, perhaps they were sexually assaulted as a child, a trafficker can use those traumas against them to further abuse them in this vicious circle here. Um, flip, flip that. If we have a domestic violence abuser who has a victim who was in a human trafficking situation, they will go ahead and use that victimization against them. So when, when you look about this, I like to show this chart because we have domestic violence, we have sexual assault, we have human trafficking, and then we have the X right in the middle. And that X represents the person who has experienced all these types of victimizations. This is going to be called a poly victim, somebody who has experienced multiple types of victimizations from usually the same person, but there can be multiple abusers. So it's interlinked, it's connected. And here at Lake Family Resource Center, like I mentioned earlier, we have a domestic violence program, a rape crisis center and a human trafficking program. And a lot of times our clients are going to fall in each one of these programs. So just some similarities of somebody who might be in a domestic violence, sexual assault or trafficking situation, they're going to experience physical violence, 99%. Most of the victims are going to have restrictions on their freedom of movement, their control, their thoughts, they're gonna be isolated. A lot of times there's no financial control or dependence. Uh, most of our victims are gonna have intimidation and fear that's all gonna be instilled in their everyday life from somebody who's abusing them. Sometimes there's gonna be some fostering of drug and alcohol dependencies. And I believe Kara will touch on that here in a little bit further along. And there's similar elements of power and control with the victimization. People abuse others. Why? Power and control. Power and control can influence many, many factors of, um, of reasons on why too abuse. And unfortunately, where this can get really tricky is a perpetrator or an abuser can use the relationship of trust to their advantage. It starts with tricks. A lot of the times it starts with a false relationship from the very, very beginning. So another video of what trafficking looks like today. Again, this is going to be another five minute clip to that we would like to share with you.
Are we on camera? Yeah, baby. Hey, Just make sure to show this at the that. wedding tomorrow. It's for filming a bachelor party ever amounted to anything good. Oh. Last night of freedom. Last night of freedom. Last up here on the right. Hey, up here on the right. Where do the high school girls hang out? I can show it to Sarah later, right? Uh, oh, the single most lucrative commercial enterprise in the world. The fastest growing crime on the planet. Yeah, girl. <laughs> hey, we're going to get shot. Boys. Yeah. Welcome to heaven. Is it's a reality. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. This is not a lifestyle choice. It'll be as long as you want to want to make it. You know. <laughs> we live in a world where we don't necessarily know what's going on next door. Yeah, I don't even know where we yeah. are right now. Oh yeah, some know. serious massage. Dude. Dude. If you're not seeing it, you're not looking for it. What kind of place is this? It's everywhere. It's not even light They live under constant threat of violence, under constant threat or actual sexual abuse. Um, they are given only enough food to sustain them. That's when I started to sing. I said, our death brings life unto our certain things. Clouds of love for me, some said, you know, to breeze. Sound is moving like a bomb. Just keep hearing that melody. It's like the radio. Nothing's playing. Take the radio again, but there's nothing playing. Moonlight illuminate my nights and my days. Sun may make the people say, how to visit something missing. So this week. I remember in particular one girl who was crying as she told her testimony. She wasn't crying because she had been forced into the sex trade. She wasn't crying because she had been beaten and raped. She wasn't crying because she'd been stripped naked and chained. She wasn't crying because her so-called parents had shoved a baton down her throat to get her to do it. She was crying because after her rehabilitation, which was coming to an end, she had nowhere else to go other than to return to those parents. A flame change my name, no one's always the same. So the funny what you find when you climb. These are 12-year-old girls, 16-year-old girls who had been kidnapped and their virginity was being sold to the highest bidder. For instance, in the sex industry, what makes slavery modern there is AIDS. You have a timeline on how long you can use a human being. And then when they're done, you just find another. During the transatlantic slave trade, the value of a young male agricultural worker on U.S. soil was an equivalent of $40,000 today. You can buy that same young male agricultural worker on U.S. soil for about $300 today. Forget justice is what love looks like in public. <laughs>
It's time for the world to focus on acknowledging that slavery still exists. It's never gone away. But we put people on the moon. We have dolphin-friendly tuna. Why can't we do the same for kids and people? Are we on camera? Yeah, baby. So we realize, we usually stop and pause at this point. We realize how heavy this subject matter can be. And given that um, we're on a public forum right now, I understand we're reaching out to a lot of people. So if you know any of the information um, that we go over is triggering or brings back some you know, issues from your past or anything current, feel free to reach out to Lake Family Resource Center. We have advocates available 24 seven to help you out. Um, call our crisis line, call the main office number and um, you know, we're here for you. So many people think human trafficking is only happening, you know, in these other foreign countries, but is it happening here in Lake County? And the answer is yes. Um, like I said, I worked for the agency for almost five years now, my previous years before human trafficking was in the rape crisis center. So back in 2018, um, we started getting more um, cases here in Lake County, um, more clients um, coming forward. There was a lot of educational pieces in the community. We had El Snow come and do some public trainings. Um, we had, um, El Snow also has a theater group that did a play um, on human trafficking at the Soper Reese in Lake Fort, which brought forward another case. Um, but the previous years before 2018, we would get maybe one or two a year of people um, coming forward and asking for help. Um, since 2018 to current, we've had three labor and 19 sex. I believe that 19 sex trafficking one is probably more like 23 at this point, we need to update. Um, and 22 or so were served by Lake Family Resource Center. Uh, and why is Lake County a prime area for, for sex trafficking activity? Um, California is one of the nation's top three destination states for human trafficking. Uh, New York and Texas would be the other two in the top three. Three of the top national 13 cities for trafficking exist in California. That's gonna be Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, and San Diego. We are two hours north of San Francisco and the Bay Area, we're two hours north, or I'm not sure which way, <laughs> for Sacramento. Uh, and Interstate 5 is only 60 miles away from here. So Interstate 5 is widely known for trafficking, people being trafficked up and down the state through I-5, the um, truck stops, a lot of trafficking happening there. We can get into some of the lingo for that as we progress further along. And who are the traffickers? So a trafficker can be anybody. It could be, you know, the person you're least likely to think would be doing the trafficking is doing it. Um, people that are educated, have psychology degrees, your friends and family, um, more, than, more often than not, it's coming from your, your, friend, your friends and your family, um, labor brokers, organized criminal groups, small business owners, gangs, street gangs, the adult industry, entertainment industry, and large factory owners. And how is this done? So there's three ways to do it. Um, one being tricked, and this is the easiest, the cheapest way. Um, they promise a better life, um, come in as like a boyfriend role. Um, lured, people get lured um, for fake jobs. We've had a few different clients that have been lured from out of the area for a fake job and then forced to do things when they got here. And then forced. And so forced, Sherry likes to talk about forced. I might let her jump into that on that one if she doesn't mind. Sure. They, what I actually like to touch on is why tricked is easier than forcing somebody. Why that's the safest and cheapest way. Because tricking somebody into a relationship, it's two people entering into a, relations, a relationship that starts romantically. There's usually not money involved. I mean, unless it's going out to dinner and stuff like that. But forced, a trafficker has to pay a kidnapper. They, the trafficker has to secure a location. The, the trafficker has to put a lot of money into those who are involved to force somebody into this type of work. It's not often that it happens that way. Yes, it does happen. We see movies on it. 
Um, there's plenty out there right now where it, sh it shows forced um, trafficking where people are kidnapped and beaten and raped. I don't want to downplay it. It does happen. It's just not the number one way of recruiting. So what are victims made to do? What are they required to do when they have been brought into this life of trafficking? So again, we talked earlier about sex trafficking and forced labor. So sex traffickers frequently are going to subject their victims um, to, to debt bondage. And this is where they tell a victim that they owe them money, often relating to victims' living experiences, expenses, and that this victim must pledge their personal services to repay the debt. So they're forced into various forms of commercial sexual exploitation, which includes um, prostitution, um, pornogra pornography, stripping, live sex shows, um, mail order brides, just to name a few. We see that prostitution is usually more common. It's easier for the trafficker to control. Um, and it's also actually common that the victims might start off like in dancing or stripping clubs, and then they will become further along down the road, coerced into situations of prostitution and pornography. The, prostitu the prostitution can happen on the streets, um, we, we do actually have some places in Lake County. I think Kara's more familiar with where this takes place as she's running the trafficking program. Um, and brothels, a brothel is a place where the buyer can go to and purchase somebody for sex acts at. And then we see, some, we see forced labor. So forms of labor trafficking Again, this is going to usually be linked to something called, again, bonded labor or forced labor. So bonded labor, also known as debt bondage, is it's, it's going to be the most widely used method. So victims become bonded laborers when their labor is demanded as, again, a means of repayment for a loan or for a service. And the value of their work is going to be much greater than the sum of the money that was actually borrowed in the very beginning. Forced labor is a situation in where victims are forced to work against their will. And it's usually under the threat of violence or some form of punishment and their freedom is going to be very restricted. And there's going to be a degree of ownership from the trafficker that is exerted. So um, this is where we're going to see, for example, on here, um, domestic service. So live and help, nannies, um, forced marriages, agriculture labor, um, sweatshop factory labor. And this is sweatshop factory labor. This is where workers are, they're pretty much packed into small places um, with machinery, the, uh, they're breathing dusty filled air, working 14 to 18 hours a day for poverty or very low wages, if any. And it's just really an illegal, Ill Ill illegal, <laughs> illegal, working conditions. Um, other things that we might see are janitorial food services and pretty much just other service industries of labor. That's where we're gonna find um, forced labor type of work.
Okay, I'm not sure what happened, but if you could just stay with us for a moment, um, hopefully Sherry can get back on. Okay, everybody, sorry about the inconvenience. Sherry is currently trying to get back on, so we will be back with you shortly.
There she is. I, I believe we might be on the recruitment one if you were done with the, um, what, are made, what are they made to do? Okay, so sorry about that, everybody. The entire system just locked up for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I don't know how far we were able to um, get in the presentation on what the victims were made to do but we can always come back to that. And I don't want to repeat myself. So we'll continue on to the show. Okay, so let's talk about recruitment and what that looks like. Uh, pimps prey on the vulnerable. And we'll get more into what the vulnerable population looks like, I believe on the next slide. Uh, they groom and they use attention and gifts and affection to do so. Um, the process involves compliments, attention, um, gifts, maybe a promise of a job, isolation. It works down into forced and labor and transport. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they'll use drugs and alcohol to control somebody or to lure them in. Um, not always. I mean, that's common misconception. Uh, there's a higher class of, um, you know, human trafficking going on that works with a more wealthy um, Johns. Um, they create emotional bonding or loyalty, and um, sometimes they become violent when the victim resists. So who are the vulnerable populations? You know, the number one vulnerable population that we have seen is runaways and foster, foster children. Um, it's basically the vulnerable are people that are not um, getting the love or the stability of a home, um, and they're looking for it elsewhere. Um, perhaps they're victims of sexual abuse, maybe immigrants um, desperate you know, to get into the United States, they have family, um, drug addicts and alcoholics, people that are hungry, poor, in debt. Um, and then you're going to see like LGBTQ, so maybe they're not accepted by their family and they're kind of outcast and so they're easy to prey on. Uh, people with uh, criminal history, you're going to see... Um, them going after people in, in the, that have been, you know, committed crimes because they're vulnerable and going to jail and maybe they're perhaps grooming them from outside of the jail and writing them, um, sending them money. So this is what some of the vulnerable populations look like. And where's the recruitment happening? Now, some of this is more, more, it, you can apply it to like bigger cities. You're gonna find like the airports and the bus stops and train stations and all that in the bigger cities. But here we do have schools, um, we have bus stops, we have you know fast food restaurants. Um, the internet's gonna be a big one for Lake County because it's easier to reach people by the internet here. Um, courtrooms, parks, playgrounds, and foster homes. These are all places for recruitment. And I just want to mention too, the reason for courtrooms, a lot of the times traffickers will know that family court happens. And a lot of times they're going to pray the halls for any type of juvenile who might have, um, who might be in the foster system or, you know, whatever their, their court process is. Um, this is a, unfortunately a way and a tactic of recruitment in a prime area as well. So what does marketing um, look like for recruiting? Um, maybe the internet is quite common. Back page, I'm not sure the back page is up anymore. I think that was taken down. But I mean, take one down and five more pop up. 
So anything on the internet, um, dating, escorting, um, sexually oriented businesses, massage parlors, strip clubs. Um, perhaps it happens by abduction. That's not as common. Um, but word of mouth, word of mouth is going to be is going to be huge um, in this criminal enterprise. You know, people just telling other people that they work with on on who and how to do something. So here is a video, an example of how the internet and online grooming could look. In the online world, predators use the same tactic and it's what we call grooming or law enforcement calls grooming. They build a relationship, they try to understand what they care about, they give them compliments, sometimes they'll even send presents or say nice things. And eventually, um, a teen will start feeling, having feelings for a predator. And it's at that point where the danger begins. The grooming behavior that we have seen can take months or it can take a very short amount of time depending on the offender. And little by little, the conversation will turn off into a very sexual nature and they'll start to talk to the child about what their interests are and they'll try to find out uh, what the child's interests are and, and often uh, they will get the child to say things that the child couldn't even imagine uh, talking about and sometimes children will talk about things that they don't even know what they mean because they're clearly very adult sexual conversations. They are inundated with sexual images and sexual conversation that allow them to very freely participate in those types of conversations and activities. Typically, I would just start by asking for a regular picture, and then if it got to that level, I would eventually ask for a, a picture of more of a sexual nature. Grooming is really easy to understand once you give thought to it. Every, everybody wants to feel loved. And these people online are willing to make you feel that way. And you know, it never occurs to you that the person that you're talking to may be a monster. And they do it in the most subtle ways, you know. You get in a fight with a friend. Your friend called you that? Oh my gosh, why would your friend ever call you that? That's not a friend. I'm your real friend. I would never say anything like that. And they pull you away from everything around you, you know, all your friends and your family and your teachers. And as you're getting pulled away, you're getting closer to him. One of the, the devices that these predators use in the interactions with kids is sending them explicit photos of themselves. Uh, what they're trying to do is sort of deaden the nerve endings. They're trying to beat down uh, the resistance. It's part of the grooming process to normalize uh, what they're trying to do, and, and it's, it's pretty insidious. So here are a few victim warning signs. And we generally use the word survivor instead of victim, but we'll use it for this slide. Um, perhaps the victim avoids eye contact um, or social interaction. They appear to have Few or no possessions, maybe they just have a purse or a backpack. Um, they're not allowed to speak for themselves. So somebody else is with them and they're going to speak for them, you know, on any kind of decisions. Um, they say they're just visiting. Maybe they have a lot of uh, hotel room keys, little slide card keys. Um, maybe they look malnourished. Um, they show signs of abuse or maybe torture. Uh, they're not in control of their own money. They don't have identification that's been taken from them, or maybe they have an excessive amount of cash on them. Um, a lot of the time they're going to be fearful or anxious around law enforcement or social workers, uh, maybe doctors and nurses, any kind of medical care. Um, they have new, numerous inconsistencies in their story. And a lot of the time you'll see branding and Sherry's going to get into what branding is and what that looks like. Right, and before we do that, let's just go ahead and, and talk about real quickly why we why we use the verbiage victim and survivor. Um, so 
when we say victim and we refer to somebody as a, as a victim, it's because usually um, the person is in the situation at the moment. So when somebody comes to us, they're usually in the situation or they're just barely, barely fleeing the situation. And so therefore they're at like a victim status still. When we say survivor, survivor technically is when somebody has been able to escape the situation and they're on their path of healing. So when we say victim or survivor, that is why. Also with human trafficking and, and again, some of our other victimization in the criminal justice, and when it comes down to the courts and convictions, the term victim also has a higher priority when it comes down to um, prosecution. So I just want to point that out as well. So more indicators of human trafficking on top of what Kara just talked about are some physical indicators and Physical indicators of traffic victims can be certain tattoos like you're seeing on this screen in front of you. Human traffickers are going to brand their victims with tattoos and what this is, it is asserting ownership over who they are trafficking. The victims are gonna be marked with barcodes. You might see a number. And when you see a barcode, this is going to actually show that somebody is over the age of 18 years old. So very simply put, you brand cattle, right? And that's how tra traffickers view their victims as a commodity to buy and sell. There was a story of a woman out of Romania and she was branded with a barcode and she was also branded with an amount and the investigator suspected that this amount that was branded on her was the amount of money that the woman would need to earn before she was released. And the National Crime Agency actually said that victims were told by their traffickers that they would have to raise as large as $64,000 before they would be able to re regain their freedom. Now, let me just say this, say this. Many will actually never get their freedom back. It is very, very rare, even after they have earned a certain amount and well beyond. So some victims will have their traffickers name. You can see some of the pictures say teddy bear, pimp or gods, whatever their name is, you know, God, queen, teddy bear, teddy bears, pimp, golden ones. And they'll have their names or their initials. Um, Usually the tattoos are going to be on the neck, something that's very visible, the neck, the chest. Um, those are going to be common areas. It can be on the arms or the legs. And this, again, is just showing that this particular victim belongs to this trafficker. And also you might see items that, um, have currency related tattoos. So money bags, old fashioned money bags, crowns, diamonds. When you see somebody who has multiple tattoos, that is, that's a pretty high indicator that somebody was being trafficked or is trafficked. Um, it's definitely a red flag. And so I know Kara, you like to add a little bit about the tattoo removal. Well, there's, there's a couple of different resources I want to touch on. Like I've reached out here locally in the county and it seems that every tattoo shop that I've come across, they said that they already cover up gang tattoos for free, but they would be happy to help out covering up branding um, as well for free, no charge. Uh, there are some programs out there. I think the closest one would be in San Jose and there's um, it's discounted or free tattoo removal. So, th so those are some of the resources we can offer somebody that comes in that is being trafficked. So again, this is just an indicator. It doesn't mean that we're actually dealing with somebody, but it's definitely something to look out for. So when you take a physical indicator such as this, some of the explanation that Kara provided a couple minutes ago. And then another indicator could be sex trafficking language. So looking on this list, we see kitty stroll, um, lot lizard, uh, pimp circle, 
these might be phrases that many of us do not understand. They might not, they might not make any sense. But for somebody who is engaged in sex trafficking, their meanings are only too clear. I always like to share that I can remember um, the first time that I heard a racial slur. I was in like kindergarten or first grade and I shared with my classmates what that word meant. And I had no idea what the word even meant or why it was hurtful. And I didn't understand why I was in trouble for, um, from my teacher asking me to apologize. I hadn't known until I was explained to me how that word had been and continues to be used that I became aware of the power of words. So there are many reasons why we should seek to understand the language of human trafficking and the sex trafficking language. If we have no grasp of the terminology, then how are we able to understand what a victim is going through, right? How will we be able to communicate with survivors about their experience? How can we acknowledge what somebody has been subjected to? Even if we are aware of the literal meaning of words, we need to be very cognizant of their distinctions. Some words that might seem straightforward have historical usage, which makes them really inappropriate. It could be very dehumanizing. So I always like to ask somebody when we're doing a live training, I like to ask what comes to people's minds. So for those who are watching, just take a moment and think, do you associate all these words with victims making poor choices or somebody being a victim, somebody as a victim? So let's look a little bit further into what some of these words mean. So I said kitty stroll. I'm gonna just go and pick a couple of these out and give you a definition so you can know um, how this language works. So kitty stroll is, this is an area of prostitution which features young women who are under the age of 18. A lot lizard is a derogatory term for a person who is being prostituted at truck stops. Um, there's a life on here, if not, so, Trafficking is called the life. You hear people talk about the life. It's a subculture of sex trafficking and it's complete with rules. There is a hierarchy, hierarchy of authority and language. It's what everybody follows. There's actually, a, there's many, many, many books on how to play the game, how to start the life. Unfortunately, you can find them on Amazon and it's, it's just horrific. Um, the John is an individual who pays for or trades a value for sexual acts. Um, let's see, choosing up is a process by which a prostitute indicates she would like a different pimp to take ownership. Squaring up is, a, is attempting to escape prostitution. And I want to point one out that is, it's pretty important. This is called the bottom. So the bottom is going to be, usually it's a female, it can be male, but this is going to be the person that is appointed by the trafficker to supervise the others and um, report rule violations to do the recruitment. This person is going to be the right hand man or right hand woman to the trafficker. And this person is going to help instruct victims. They're going to collect money. They're going to post bail. They're going to post ads. They're going to inflict punishment on those who don't obey. This bottom person is going to go down for the trafficker. Kara, did you want to elaborate on the bottom? Yeah, because I think that it's an important piece, um, especially for education in this community after the last couple of years. So the bottom, the bottom bitch, um, is usually the original victim. Um, they are being forced to do what they're what they're doing and sometimes they'll take a charge on it um they a lot of the time have been abused longer and more than anybody else in the situation and um so there's a lot of educational pieces that come along with the bottom that um i'd love to explain if somebody wants to reach out to me and then just one more caught a case so this is going to be a term that refers to when a pimp or a victim has been arrested with charges. So the point of me giving you some definition of these phrases are that 
generally in public or through work or whatnot, we might encounter people who use some of this jargon. It's really important to be able to put together when listening to somebody who might be a potential victim. So for example, if we are sitting across from a person and they say, they're going into automatic because daddy caught a case, that's definitely a sign that a person is being trafficked or in the life or was in the life. So again, language, it is a powerful tool. It has an amazing ability to build up and encourage, but it also has the power to tear down and defeat. So approaching and understanding the language can just help so immensely. It can help individuals. It can help communities just more intimately understand the human, the issues of human trafficking and who is most impacted by it. And I think it's just very important to um, understand, and this will help us move forward to taking action. So understanding the traffic language, being able to recognize physical indicators, being able to recognize emotional and mental indicators, put them all together. If you see somebody that exhibits all of these, then it's, it's time to start referring, or it's time to start having concern or calling Lake Family Resource Center or, or just making that first step of, of help. So as we come to the end of the presentation, we love showing this clip of Rebecca Bender, who is now a CEO and funder. She's a, um, a well-known author and advocate for human trafficking um, awareness and healing, the path of healing. And this video really takes everything that we've talked about from being in a relationship and the act of prostitution and how that affects somebody. So let's share. born and raised in a small town in Southern Oregon. And I was a good kid in school. I grew up in a normal middle-class family. Um, I got great grades. I was really active in sports and I even graduated a year early. I was accepted into Oregon State University and I had my dorm room already assigned and I was really excited to move up to Corvallis. But that summer I got pregnant by my boyfriend and I had to make a real tough decision whether I was going to keep my baby and unenroll from university or get an abortion and keep it all a secret. And that was a really tough summer for me. After I had the baby, I had some friends that had gone up to U of O to go to college and they had an extra room in one of their apartments. It was at that time that I met a boy or a guy who pretended um, to take interest in me. I really thought he liked me and we got along really well. He was really funny and charming and he had a nice car and he, he always picked up the tab. He had nice clothes. And he told me he was a record producer, that he had a band um, up in Portland. And that's why he frequently went out of town. There's a saying that says, when you take a child by the hand, you take the mother by the heart. And I really think that's what happened for me because I had this new little girl and this man who showed this desperate attention towards her, like he wanted to really help make this family that I really wanted for my daughter. And he invited me to move in with him after about six months of dating. And I was really excited. And I brought him down to Southern Oregon to meet my family and everything seemed fine until we arrived in Las Vegas. He said we were moving there because that was the entertainment capital of the world and being a record producer and having um, a band that that's where they were gonna get the most gigs and the most jobs and that's where his job was leading him. So I desperately uh, wanted to go with him, to be with him and, and to start this family that, that he promised me. He pulled up to an escort service and he said, this is how it works in Vegas. I've spent a lot of money to get you here. I put first and last on an apartment. I filled your fridge up with food and you're gonna need to get, earn that money back. And I felt, I felt trapped. I felt like, um, how am I gonna get out of this? And you didn't know if you were gonna live or die. You didn't know what he was gonna do or what he was capable of. And so it's, it was really scary. I can remember just running through the casino thinking, I 
these people don't even have a clue what's going on. They're just, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching, Las Vegas, yay! And they're doing all this stuff, and I'm, I'm running for my life. I'm running from the man that has forced me into doing things that I didn't want to do. When you have a, a trafficker that's waiting at home with your child and says, if you don't bring home $1,500, you're going to find your daughter out on the corner. I think I was probably more frightened to go home than I was to be in the room. Because if you got robbed, it was your fault for being stupid. Um, if you got raped, it was your fault for not watching your back. Anything that happened to you was typically your fault, and you incurred more punishment um, for allowing those things to happen to you. So it made you always walk in fear of your trafficker. By the way, her and her daughter are doing amazing. Like I said, they are, um, she is a survivor leader, an advocate, and living a really good life now. So just happy to report on the success at the tail end of that story. So how can the community help? How, what, the, what can you do? What can our community do? Well, you can be educated by simply watching this particular webinar. You are doing something by becoming more educated and aware of what is happening. And it is happening. If you are ever in contact with anyone who needs help, contact the trafficking hotline or Lake Family Resource Center, local resources. And understand that getting out of this life is not simple. It is very hard. And a lot of people do not actually make it out. Ask questions. Don't ever assume. Ask questions. Hear the story. Give somebody control back to be able to speak and share what is on their mind and what they have been going through. And give them that control. Remember, traffickers can be both men and women. So please just be open and know that traffickers can be anyone and a victim can be anybody. So as we wrap up this presentation, in just a moment, Kara will go ahead and talk about some of our resources that Lake Family Resource Center has to have, that has to offer. But first, to close out. Human trafficking is slavery. And it happens all over America. Any child, any woman, any man could potentially become a victim of human trafficking. I am a victim of labor trafficking. I was a victim of child sex trafficking, but now I own my body. Human trafficking is any kind of forced labor. It can happen to anybody. I am a mother. I am an author. I am a son. I'm an advocate. I am an educator. I'm a sister. I am a brother. I'm so much more than what happened to me. I am strong. I am brave. I am outspoken. I am compassionate. I am a survivor. 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 I am a survivor of human trafficking. watching this, whether it's today or next week, but I want to thank you for watching and educating yourself. This is a community-based problem and we all need to be on the same page. Um, some resources, as with all of our victim service programs, we offer counseling, we have therapists. Um, if it's an emergency situation, we can um, do emergency shelter, food, clothing, um, accompaniment to whether it's the hospital or the police department or court, um, personal advocacy, criminal advocacy, we work with all of our local partners um, and we have a well-rounded situation that we can help somebody. And if we don't have something that we can do, then we know where to find the help. So Sherry and I um, have other presentations we can do. Uh, we're really trying to get education out into the community. We have a um, medical-based um, presentation similar to this, but more based on medical needs. And, and if you're in a doctor's office in that kind of setting, um, maybe if you work in a motel where a lot of the trafficking is happening, uh, we can uh, educate the um, staff at the motel. Um, and then we have an intersections of, um, as she spoke about earlier, um, essay, which is sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking. 
So please feel free to reach out and we're excited to help. And thank you again for watching this. If you're replaying, feel free to leave comments. We will watch the comment box after the session is over. And thank you for helping spread awareness on human trafficking. Again, January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And this month, we are going to shine the light on human trafficking. And that started with today. So again, thank you very much. And have a great day.